Professor Sir David King is the government chief scientist. Um, and, and therefore, he, you, you occasionally hear him on the radio and see him on the TV telling us about scientific things that we should be very concerned about, like global warming or mad cow disease or uh, things of that sort that I panic about, like everybody else, and know very little about. And he describes uh, what I'm told is a famous biological experiment. And it's called the frog broiler. <coughs> The story goes, and it may be apocryphal, it may be sort of a scientist joke on the rest of us, but the, the story goes that if you take live frogs, I must apologise to any vegetarians um, in the room, if you take live frogs and throw them into a pot of boiling water, they will very sensibly and instinctively jump out of the pot and save their skins. But if on the other hand, you take a pot of cold or room temperature water and introduce the same live frogs and gently apply heat. The frogs will find it rather quite a pleasant experience <laughs> and the water will heat and the frogs will gently and quietly and happily boil to death. And that is the best analogy that I've ever heard and I do apologise again to the faint-hearted and the sensitive and, and the vegetarians. It's the best <laughs> analogy I've ever heard for the way in which we become complacent about our rights and freedoms in a great democracy like the United Kingdom. Perhaps because we didn't have to struggle for a written constitution and an entrenched bill of rights in the way that, that, that various former British colonies did, we've become, in my view, incredibly complacent about our rights and freedoms. And, you know, sometimes the, the, the way we let them go is almost a little, like the, like the frogs with the, with the heat applied from, from underneath, and we, and we, we merrily sign them away um, for, for various reasons, some of them laudable, some of them legitimate. But nonetheless, the, the, the danger is ever present. I'm director of something called Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties, and we've been around since 1934. And I suppose the organisation, a pressure group, a campaign group, whatever you want to call it, an NGO, that's a sort of trendy <coughs> language for people that do a lot of talking and sometimes speak internationally and a domestically non-governmental -government, go organisation. We've been around for for all of those years campaigning for, for rights and freedoms in this country. We're not like Amnesty or Human Rights Watch. Ours is not the campaign for people all over the globe, though increasingly things like the war on terror link us up with, um, with, the, with the interests of people all over the world. And, and we've been on two very important journeys over the last 70 odd years. The first is a political journey, because the organisation was born on the left of politics, and actually quite, quite far on the left of politics. It was founded by, and I've never really properly investigated this, but, but, but people who were communists, but somehow also libertarians in the 19th century. Apparently this was possible, and um, you know, perhaps when I retire and have time to, to, to look into these things, I'll, uh, I'll look into that. Um, some, some very serious <coughs> names to conjure with, people on the left of politics, George Orwell, all, all sorts of other people, writers, thinkers, lawyers. And they were concerned that in London in the 1930s, the police were too concerned with protecting Oswald Mosley's black, black shirts and not with protecting the Jewish communities in the East End who were being intimidated by them. And they felt that anti-fascist protesters were being abused rather than protected by the police. And that was one of the key, uh, the key drivers for the formation of the National Council for Civil Liberties. But over the years, that political reference point has changed. Certainly by the 70s and 80s, Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties, it was still called that, was not particularly uh, on the far left of politics. It was, well, it was in the Labour, it was affiliated to the Labour Party. Uh, my predecessors include people like Patricia Hewitt, who now sits in the new Labour cabinet, and Harriet Harman was her, was her deputy. Um, but in the last few years, we found it incredibly important as a matter of principle and good practice to be now a truly cross-party and non-party campaign. And that's because we truly believe that all Democrats should unite around the, the framework 
the post-war framework of rights and freedoms. And that takes me to the second journey that we've been on. Because, of course, in the 1930s, there, were, there, there was no international human rights framework. There was just an instinct that we don't want to be abused by police officers or an overweening state. Leave me alone, no overweening <coughs> state, and don't interfere with my freedom. An instinct, a perfectly good instinct. And by the way, there are lots of things from that, that period that, that resonate today. We, we found some old newspaper cuttings in our basement a few years ago when we were tidying up. And we found front pages of the Daily Mail from that period. The Daily Mail in that period, by the way, was very concerned with an influx of Jewish refugees, people from Eastern Europe who were coming over here to take our jobs and <laughs> make, make our lives a, a misery. That's in the 1930s. <coughs> some things change and some things stay the same. But after the Holocaust and the Blitz, something quite unique happened, in my view, in the history of the world. And what happened was that Democrats, slightly to the right of politics, slightly to the left of politics, people of all the great world religions and people of no religion at all, decided that they could agree on a framework, just a framework, not magic answers to every, every problem that would ever be thrown up, but a framework of rights and freedoms without which you cannot have democracy itself. And this framework would sit as part of the rule of law in any great democracy around the world and would enable democracy itself to survive. And we find it particularly difficult when elected politicians suggest, for example, that, that unelected judges have no authority to adjudicate on matters of rights and freedoms and that everything is a matter of free elections and the pendulum of politics swinging every few years. Now, of course, I accept, as a Democrat, that free elections and regular elections and the mandate that comes with winning those elections is an incredibly important part of democracy. But it's not, it's not the end of the story. And with that, we say, a small bundle, a small bundle of non-negotiable rights and freedoms and the independent judiciary to adjudicate over those rights and freedoms, the rule of law, democracy will eat itself. Democracy can degenerate very quickly into something quite different. And today's government, with a popular majority and a massive mandate, can decide that actually, in these difficult, dangerous times in which we live, that free speech that's a little critical of the government ought to perhaps be restricted. Those elections that are essential to democracies we've discussed perhaps need to be postponed. They do give the terrorists a target after all. And quickly, this wonderful model of democracy descends into, frankly, something little better than more rule. And so that's why we say, unashamedly, that rights and freedoms and the rule of law are essential to democracy itself. <coughs>